church. Today's scripture reading is going to be Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. <clears throat> Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the, the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all of the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the, to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on a day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Thank you, Nathan. It's great to have Nathan back. I can't believe he's already through college. It seems like he just left. It makes me feel pretty old. But that's a great thing. Lots of good things today. If you're just visiting with us, we're doing something called the story, which is to be able to look at the Bible and uh, learn the basic story of what the Bible is all about. And so we're going to look at some of that. But also today is Mother's Day. And so hopefully you remembered that. And I just wanted to say Happy Mother's Day. So we also have roses for all of you mothers. If you were in class or you came in the a different door, they're back in the foyer, so don't forget to go and get one of those. Uh, those are for you, and so we want you to feel good about that. Uh, I also give you this year. Yay! So if he doesn't run around to all of you and get a chance to say hi to you, you might want to go over and say hi to him, okay? So just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, next Sunday is Senior Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. Bryce will be preaching. He'll be talking about our seniors and presenting a challenge to them. And that's going to be a great time. In case you get to see me up close, you will know I believe in zombies now. The apocalypse has started. Uh, no, don't worry. For the first time in my life, I can say I will be better looking soon. <laughs> Usually there's been no excuse for it, and you're just stuck there, but uh, a little bit of skin cancer and having to do the face feel thing, so I'm trying to get that all taken care of. That way I don't have to answer everybody's question with what happened to you, or what did Nancy do to you? <laughs> so we want to talk about Joshua this morning. I hope you were in class to follow through and to listen to all the story and listen to what happened there. Uh, that's just an amazing story. If there's ever a time of, of great conquest, if there's ever a time of victory, that's one of the best times because you're able to see some tremendous things that are happening there. Moses has already led the people for 40 years and then Moses is taken. Uh, God says, okay, you're done. I don't know that this is such a bad thing for God to just say, okay, you're done. Uh, we're going to go out to a mountain and uh, you're, you're over with. That sounds pretty good. I mean, as long as I'm ready, uh, you have to live your life, though, in order to be ready for something like that. 
And Joshua has been following him. Joshua has been his assistant. Joshua's the one who's been there, and, and he's been with Moses the whole time, even before he was appointed. He didn't just start and then say, here we are, here's what's going on, and here's how, how we do all of these things, is, is just, well, if you'll appoint me in charge, then I'll, I'll try and do some work. No, he was there all the time. He was there with Moses. He was making things happen. He was always there being able to do things. And so you see him very zealous for God and very zealous for the work. He believes in all of this. He is there at the tent of meeting. He is there with Moses. And finally, Moses says, I've got too much. I can't do this, God. And he says, well, give some to Joshua. And so Joshua has been around for a long time with the training in all of this. But I love the first chapter as God comes and he talks to Joshua for the first time. I think this is what we always wish would happen with us. God basically comes and says, any battle you fight, you will win. The promise that I gave to Abraham, you are going to get to fulfill it. The land that I'm giving for his descendants, everywhere you step, walk, see, is yours. Just go take it. I want you to be strong and courageous. I want you to not back down. I want you to realize that you are the one who is able to do so many things and that I will always be with you. I want you to keep my statutes. I want you to keep the commandments. I want you to lead people so that they will be able to keep all of those commandments and do everything that I have told them to do. Don't let that word depart out of your mouth. It's going to be exactly as I said. And then you will have success wherever you go. Every single thing that you do will work. Does that happen to you? That didn't happen to me. Wait a minute, God. Why didn't you say, Terry, everything you ever try will always work? And we don't have that kind of a promise. But maybe we're not involved as much in God's word and in fulfillment as what Joshua was. Now, I don't know that he always gets what he wanted for dinner. Well, he does. It's man. You already know what it is. <laughs> uh, he's had that for a while. But in everything that he tries to do for God, if you were completely unlimited and could do anything you wanted and you knew it would be a success, what would you do? What is it that you would do if you knew God would make and fund and enable every single thing you wanted to do for him? And I think one of the very saddest things is we have no idea. We never even thought about it. We never even really imagined it. I mean, if I could do anything I wanted, right, why not? Well, I, I have to think about it. Where is our faith? You see, as you look at some of this, you realize here is what he's been able to do. As God has said, I want you to be strong and courageous. I have commanded you. Has not God commanded us? Has he not given us some things to be able to accomplish and some things to do and some promises to live on to say, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to live. This is the way in which I want you to do things and, and I want worship. I mean, you made it here already. That's working for you. What a great thing to be able to have these kinds of promises and to be able to realize that God will always be with us and God will always help us win battles. What a tremendous thing. You just be strong and courageous. Wouldn't that be great to be able to have that? I'm not sure we don't. Maybe we're just a little short on the other side of things. And I want to present this as a challenge to you today. To be able to at least think about it. If God would do anything I thought with his will, what is it that I would do? Well, uh, what, conquer a land? 
Uh, maybe you need to think of something else a little bit more practical. You see, they've been at this point before. They have been at the point where they're right at the border of the land and they're ready to go in. You remember they sent in the 12 spies and Joshua and Caleb were the only two that came back with a good report. And they had the big meeting and everybody presents and 10 spies, I mean 10 times you get to hear, no we can't do it, no we can't do it, no we can't do it, no we can't do it. That must have been awful to realize that. How bad is that to go over and over and over? We're a failure, we're like grasshoppers, we can't do all of this. So this time when they get there, Joshua says, I'm only sending in two spies and I'm not going to tell anybody. That's smarter, right? He says, you guys just go check it out. And sure enough, they go and they you know, are about to be captured. But Rahab is there, and Rahab hides the spies, and she gets the promise, and she says, for me and for my family, for my mom, for my dad, for my brothers, for my sisters, I want you to spare us. Now, she has great faith. She knows this is coming. She knows it's all going to happen. We, we're scared of you guys. And so she knows absolutely all of this is going to be there. And so you see them being able to come in with a huge way as they come in to conquer the land. And so they cross the Jordan, they build the altar, and it's a monument that is for them. Some things have been left undone, like circumcision. I mean, that was clear back with Abraham, and well, they hadn't done it for 40 years, so ouch. Passover hadn't been kept. I mean, Passover had been there as they came out, and then they didn't keep it. And so for 40 years, they have not kept Passover. It's time to get that started again. It's time to reinvest. It's time to be able to figure out. And so they begin with Passover again. They go to Jericho, and they follow the instructions of the marching and the trumpets and the shouting, and the walls fall down, and they're able to go in and capture the city. What a tremendous thing. Of course, then you've also got AI, which is one of those that's real difficult because they didn't think they needed much. And the battle of AI makes cover up and mistakes and just things you have to deal with. And then the deception from Gideon. And it doesn't mean everything's perfect that you don't get deceived and you don't have any defeat. But he says, you know, if you'll follow me and do what I said. And yeah, he's got to deal with people like Achan, and he's got to deal with deceptive people who are around him. And yeah, they were able to do some things with them. They defeat the, the five kings in the south and in the north. And what a huge conquest this is. If you ever read this right out of the Bible, wow, it's just amazing all the things. If they ever made this into an action movie, it would be one amazing action movie. I mean, these guys are warriors. These guys are fighters. These guys are important. So how did they make that change? How did they change the people who came out of Egypt, who were afraid of everything, who saw themselves as being scared of the fact that, well, there's giants in the land. I don't think the giants necessarily went away. Uh, now they've got big walls. So as you begin to look at this and begin to realize, well, here's where we are, you realize the difference is in the people that got there. And sure enough, God had said, you know, for all of those of you who are older, we're waiting for you to die. I'm not saying that this morning. Because some of our older people are great people of faith. And that's what you need to have. That's what we need to have is those older generations to be a real people of faith who are able to lift up and able to stand up and say, here's how it's happened, like Moses. And then Joshua comes and takes over, and now there's all these things going. And, but how did they change? Could we turn America around in 40 years? From a nation that is somewhat following God Kind of. To a nation that is absolutely, completely dedicated to God to do absolutely everything God says. Could we do that in 40 years? What would it take? Could we walk into a new promised land? Could we have this kind of faith to build a nation like this? 
see, you've changed an entire group of people. I think America might be a little bit larger now than then, but what would it take to be able to accomplish that? Well, I think there are some things that are important. And one of the biggest answers, I know this is kind of odd, one of the biggest answers is Mother's Day. Seriously. Think about it. Women of faith and what mothers do to raise men of faith. How do you get men of faith? Give them good moms who believe, who are willing to teach them what faith is really all about, who are willing to say, yes, we're going to church this morning. What do you mean you can't find your shoes? We're going to church this morning. And so you're going to have to wear the old ones. And they faced daily tasks and they faced difficulties, but they said, we are going to do this. We don't want to live like this. You see, they were powerless to be able to do anything about it. Could they wield a sword? Could they do anything about it? But they are not powerless. They realize one thing. I need to be strong and courageous. And I perhaps have the greatest advantage ever. Because I have a son. And all I have to do is give him faith. And he will have the chance to change the world. And I think they realized that. And I think they knew that. And I think that's the way this happened. You see, they know how to live in submission and be strong and courageous at the same time. And how to teach what faith means. We, we look at the big warriors and all the swords and all the weapons and things like that. But, you know, sometimes it's a person who's weak, who has great faith, and is severely outnumbered that is strong and courageous. Because all the weapons are just a bluff. And they won't really use them. And they train the next generation to be children of faith. They train that generation to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And most often, sadly, is the wife that has to say it. Because she's the one that's going to make all the difference. Most often it's the wife that has to say, we're going to Sunday school. Because the sad part is dad's don't. They don't insist. They don't say, come on, Mom, get out of bed. We're going to church today. And you need to be in class because you need to learn some of this. You see, they realize to change a generation, they are going to be stuck in a wilderness forever if they don't get some faith. How do we get some faith? We're going to start with our children. And I know that's one of the dilemmas we've been thinking about and facing as we watch America and that a, a lot of the children are not being faithful. That is the worst news possible. Because that's also the way to turn it around. Is for those children to be children of faith. For those children to learn what God wants, to be able to follow what God wants, and to be able to do exactly that. Let me give you a couple of examples because I think this is huge. Go back to Moses in Exodus chapter 2. Actually, to Moses' mom. And while it's not specific in the text, I'm going to take a lot of liberties here. It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. I think she believes her child can do something. You see, they're killing all the babies at this point, and all she has to do is have him cry once and the soldiers are going to come. But I think she believes that something can happen here. Because every mother believes in the potential of their child. This one's going to be great. This one's going to do good things. And we all think that. We all know that. We all believe that. What an incredible thing it is. 
She's about to change the whole nation. But not just by herself. And why do I think this? Because she sends her daughter to watch. Now why would you send your daughter to watch? She's going to put him in the basket. It's all black, covered with pitch. I'm going to slide it out here into the water. I want you to be able to watch him drown. That's nothing but cruel. Isn't it? Unless she realizes, and I know I'm reading a lot into this, that this is where Pharaoh's daughter comes. There's a good chance this is the prettiest baby ever. Unfortunately, mothers think that. No matter who their child is or how ugly he is, they, mothers always think this is the prettiest baby ever. What an incredible thing it is for her to say, you just watch what God's going to do. You just imagine what God's going to do because this could be the change in it all. This could make all the difference. How are we going to get a leader? How are we ever going to get out of slavery? We're going to raise one. Well, that's a long ways. Yeah, maybe we need to be thinking in terms of some of those long-term plans that God has. Because that's exactly what he's doing. Watch what God can do with this. I think she knows he's going back to the palace. I think she knows as she begins to feed him and to talk with him, as she gets the place appointed as nurse, that here's what we're going to do, son. She's got a very short time to instill faith in him and to say, now you're going to be the next leader. You're going to be king of Egypt. You're going to be able to change slavery. You're going to... Do you do that to a two-year-old? Yeah. Yeah, you do. And you teach him about faith from that point. Because by the time he's, what, three? He's gone. He's in the palace. Maybe four or five. You see, it's all got to be done. Faith has got to be built into him before then. And you realize what God's able to do in faith of mom is just incredible. Moses tries to jump early. He tries to say, yes, I think I am that. I think we can do this. And God has to say, no, you're too anxious. I want you to know I'm the one who's doing it, not you, and so I'm going to make you wait a little bit. And so, but he does turn out to be a great man of faith and a guy who has a bigger view of the problem. And he understood what it was his place to do. Even if God does make him wait, he understands what it's his place to do. How did he get that? I think it's got to have been suggested beforehand. Another one that just really, I think, makes a huge difference where I can see all of this is in John chapter 2 with Jesus and his mother. He started his ministry. Uh, this claims to be the first miracle. And in John chapter 2, it says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, well, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there, and the Jewish rites of, for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. You ever had your mom do that? You know, somebody needs help. Somebody needs, oh, I was playing. Yeah, but they need this and they need that. Can you bring in the groceries? Can you go do this? Can you carry this? Oh, you're big and strong. You're my strong boy. Yeah, we all bought it, didn't we? <laughs> okay. I can be the strong. Nobody ever said, yeah, I'm really not. I think I just want to be weak and lay here on the floor. No, I just want to turn into a puddle and have no muscle whatsoever. No, we believed it. We said, yes, Mom, I am. I, I can be the strong man. How do we get strong men? Because somebody 
believed in us enough to tell us that we could be. And that's how we got there. And I think that's what she's doing with him. And whether it's changing the world and causing something to happen here, or whether it's you know a, a crisis at a wedding, she comes to him and goes, they don't have anyone. They've already run out. Okay. What is she expecting? What does she think? He's going to go buy some? Doubtful. He's got 12 guys, which may be the reason they ran out of wine. I mean, I know they were invited, but these guys, you know, may have done a little bit too much. And so, dumps the problem squarely in his lap. And she tells the waiters, do whatever he tells you. I don't think she's got a clue how he's going to do it. I don't think she knows at all what's going to happen next. She says, I, I just believe in him. And I'm going to dump the problem in his lap and say, now, do something with it. You ever had your mom do that? Sure enough, you try and figure out something. Yeah, okay, well, I can do this. Good job, son. <laughs> That's what it takes. Somebody who believes in you. Not necessarily somebody that tells you exactly everything of how to do it. That won't do it. But somebody who believes in you enough to just say, here, son. Here's the issue. Here's the problem. Here's where we are. And then everyone else do whatever he says. Wow. That's a lot of faith in him. This party's fixing to be a real disaster, isn't it? Well, we gave it to Jesus, but, you know, uh, all we got was all. <coughs> they got the best one here. Because she believed in him. And I think that's what moms do. They believe their kids into doing something that they didn't know they could do before. Does that change the world? Absolutely. And that's really what it's all about, is being in, yes, we can change the world. I don't think she knows what's coming next, but she gives him something to do and I think you've probably been given something to do that you didn't exactly know. But somebody believes in you. The world is a mess. And it's losing God. And what is the answer? I think it's moms and dads that are willing to teach their children what faith is really all about. The ones that are willing to stand up for God. We could easily say it's not my responsibility. They should have planned better. They should have more wine. They should have done whatever. And we can look at all of society and say, yeah, they should have done this. And I'm too small. I can't do anything about it. But you have the influence of someone who can. Right now, they're upstairs in CDH, right? But they will change the world. It's a longer view. But we didn't get here overnight either. But that is what makes all the difference. And so I think Joshua's mom is the same way. I think Joshua's mom has given him that idea and says, why don't you go help Moses? I think you ought to just go hang out down there by the tent of meeting. Isn't it great what Moses is doing? As she talks to him, she talks to him, she tells him all these things. Here we are, we're in this wilderness, and she gives him the story. We're headed toward a promised land, and we're going to get there. I believe we can get there. We've just got a little bit of a delay right now, and we're going to need somebody else to lead us in. Moses was 80 when he started. What do you think is going to happen? Sometimes we just have absolutely no plan for anything that's going to happen later. No, there's got to be a better plan as we develop some of these younger people to be able to say, I need some people of faith here who are able to stand up and do some things. And Joshua says, that's me. 
God makes it possible for him to believe and for him to get a bigger view of the world and for him to realize something. And this is such an odd story when it comes to Joshua because then you've got Rahab right in the middle of it. Oh, Rahab. We don't want to talk about Rahab. As far as I can tell, when they meet Rahab, she's not a mother, okay? It mentions mom and dad, brothers and sisters, and she makes the deal for all of them that, you know, if I'm going to hide you and not scream and not let them capture you, then you're going to take care of my family. But she already knows. She already believes. She already knows what God's able to do. She already knows the great things that are going to happen and all the good things that are coming. Some people who sin have great faith. Please do not write them off just because they have had sin in their life. She is going to change. She is going to be different as she comes into the land of Israel. She is not going to practice the same thing that she has been doing. It's one of the temple prostitutes. I mean, she, it's their whole culture. It's what they do. She's just one of them. And, well, it was perfectly acceptable. I mean, you're the worship leader. The way you're leading the worship may not be such a great thing, but here they are, and they are big enough to take her in. Why? Because she put them in an awkward position and it was blackmail. No. Because they are people of integrity, and when they say they will do something, they will do something. You see, they have to believe in these poor, pitiful people who are wandering around in the desert as much as they're going to believe in a prostitute who lives on the city wall. And yes, those, those are God's people because they are people of faith. You talk about strong and courageous. She is. They find out she's dead. She hides them, and they escape. And Rahab has a child named Boaz after they get into the promised land. She's gonna, he's going to be the husband of Ruth that we're going to study next week. And the lineage goes, Boaz, the father of Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of King David. You do not get a David without a Rahab. And we want to make our, our living so nice and pure and, and everything's good and all the people are good. and every No, all the people are faithful. All the people stood against the odds. All the people looked at something else and said, this can work. Rahab's son will be a man of faith. That's what's incredible. Once again, mom teaches a guy how to believe so that he's able to follow the law, so that he's able to be part of this lineage of Jesus. What an incredible story. And I hope that means we can include all of us. Joshua 24 is the, the great challenge that I think we all look to. And he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness, put away the gods that are your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of, our, of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people all agreed. They said, yes, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, no, you won't. I said, what? He said, no, you won't. You'll be tempted. They said, yes, we will. He says, no, you won't. There's a lot of commandments and God is holy and God will not put up with it when you disobey him. They said, yes, we will. We will obey him. And he said, then I want a covenant. I want a promise. 
I want you to say in blood, in writing, in your own heart that you will do this. And the people said, okay. If that's what it takes to convince you, then we will make a covenant with you. And it's kind of like us today, isn't it? That's what God says. Here's my laws. Here's the thing I want you to do. I want you to be like my son. And we say, okay, we will. This is not so fast. I don't think you're going to keep it. But we will. He says, you don't understand. I'm a holy God and you are not. In order to get there, you have to make a covenant in blood. A covenant through my son, Jesus Christ. And all those people who are willing to do that are able to enter into that covenant and make that promise to him, yes, we will follow you and everything that you have said. And I love the last verse in this whole thing. We will serve the Lord our God. And in verse 31, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. I know it's just one verse. It is the only time in history it happens. The absolute only time. In America, in all of history, is Joshua. Because they changed the nation from people who were scared and unbelievers to people of faith. And it was going to take them all. And they decided, yes, we will. It took men like Joshua. And it took women like Rahab. To say we can make a difference. We can change the world. How? How's it ever going to happen? We're just small people. We just live in Arizona. Nobody pays attention to Arizona. Maybe if we lived in Washington, D.C. or somewhere like that and we had this big influence, he says, no, you don't understand. All you have to do is raise your children to be people of faith. And when we promise to do all that God has said, and our children believe, God makes opportunity. And God does the improbable and the impossible. And the world changes. And that's your job this day. Yes, it can happen. And we are so thankful for the mothers that are here today that have done that, that are doing that, and for the faith we see in our people.